Welcome to the sixth installment of Encounters, New Perspectives on Asia, America and Europe with Hong Kong activist and dramatist Patu Yen. Um, my name is Barbara Mittler. Um, I'm uh, introducing now this lecture series, Heidelberg Center of American Studies with my colleague Valve Werner and Katz, um, a series of dialogues uh, initiated by the two institutions, so by the Heidelberg Center for American uh, Studies and the Center for Asian and Transcultural Studies. And in this series, we have focused on the relationship between the two superpowers, that is the U.S., and China, the two superpowers of the 21st century, um, and uh, Europe's role in this sort of triangle of power. Um, of course, the stunning rise of the People's Republic of China in recent decades, um, its international relations um, uh, have basically not become easier, have become rather contentious, and China's growing self-confidence is one which is a challenge for the U.S., um, and of course, then implication is there, the allies as well. And thus, um, it embroils every one of our lives, it embroils Europe just as much. Um, so in this new, if you want, trans-Pacific geopolitical rivalry, uh, what is Europe's function? Um, how can we um, think about Europe's security? Um, a thought, and um, what, uh, how much are we dependent on the United States for that? Um, with its economics ties to China uh, growing considerably um, uh, over the last decades, but also growing more and more difficult. As a result, the European Union and especially Germany um, uh, have and are looking for sort of constructive approaches to a simmering, actually open conflict uh, in this situation. And it's of conviction that uh, as Europeans, we need to know more about these two nations, um, about the US, about China, um, because we know that they will sh shape the world. They are already shaping the world um, that we're living in and that we will be living um, in, in the 21st century. So we need to improve our understanding of this complex relationship. And it's for this reason that we basically started this series of encounters um, at the beginning of uh, the semester, or no, actually two semesters ago already. And we hope that these dialogues will contribute to an informed um, debate on one of the most imminent challenges, obvious challenges for Europe, for the Americans, uh, and for the world. And so the dialogue today is a dialogue which it will involve Pato Yen, an activist working from Hong Kong in a global conversation that basically calls on politics as well as civil involvement from Asia, from America, and from Europe. Um, and we are going to point to how engaged art is trying and can be trying to make a difference in world politics. Um, so um, this encounter is actually part of a whole Hong Kong week um, that we have this week, um, which also sees the screening of Bohemia on uh, Thursday evening, and then um, a couple more screenings um, on Friday organized by our, by our students. And of course, we are remembering um, the Hong Kong protest movement and basically do this um, because July 2022 is 25 years after July 1997. And July 1997 is the moment when Hong Kong enters a new world order, that of one country, two systems. Negotiated between Britain and China in 1982, um, creating the so-called basic law, which guarantees certain rights to Hong Kong that are interpreted in very interesting ways um, on both sides of um, the uh, sort of border <laughs> to the mainland, which no longer is a real border. So what we're going to do um, today is to think about sort of this moment, to think about Hong Kong. We do so, um, and Hong Kong in the world order, its importance in this conflictual relationship between the US and China, um, and we do so with Pato Yen. So let me introduce very briefly um, Pato Yen to you. You will uh, meet him uh, elaborately throughout um, the session. Um, so 25 years after 1997, today, we want to go back to that moment in 1997, which was a moment of awakening for Patu Yen, who 
who was born in 1975 in Hong Kong, where he studied English literature and sociology. So around the time of the turnover, that's when he is, what, around 22, I guess, something like that, right, 1997, you're, yes. Um, he works as an author and a director of dystopian drama at the New Writing Laboratory in Hong Kong. Um, he leaves Hong Kong in 2014, um, comes to Europe, earns a master's degree in playwriting from the Royal Holloway University of London, and then becomes um, a well-known activist writer, not just in Hong Kong, but also in Europe. So in 2016, he's invited to the Berlin Stücke Markt um, with his award-winning play, play, A Concise History of Future China, in the English translation, we'll talk about that. Um, and then in 2017 and 18, he realizes a sort of two-part immersive theater evening uh, called Flow of Time and Stream of Consciousness at the Hong Kong Fringe Club, very important um, a place that you might talk about later in the conversation. Um, and then he um, has his uh, play White Blaze of the Morning premiered um, in Hong Kong at the Hong Kong Repertory Theatre in, in 2015 and is awarded Best Play at the 8th Hong Kong Theatre Libre um, with A Post-Human Condition, which is a trilogy um, uh, on sort of the human condition, to, together with History of Future and Sound Everywhere in the Universe. He has, meanwhile, written um, uh, these three plays in which he explores what it means to be human um, today and in the future. Um, these pieces were premiered in April 2021 at Schauspiel um, Frankfurt, that was post-human condition, and uh, in Mannheim, with um, Sound Everywhere in the Universe. Um, and in Mannheim, he is, if you so want, um, Schiller of the 21st century, right? So he's the, um, he's the author in residence. I don't know, I'm not quite sure how they call it. House, house autor um, at the Mannheim National Theater um, at the moment. And um, uh, he's also um, just recently had um, his first libretto performed in Mannheim, um, a libretto for the opera The Damned and the Saved that we also talk about uh, in a minute, uh, which was performed in a, and, and also basically put up in a joint effort between Munich Biennale, yeah, I guess, Biennale. Munich, Munich Biennale and the Mannheim uh, National Opera. There you have the possibility of confusing reality and dream, um, which seems so obvious that it makes one shudder because the reality in that nightmare dream is so real. His play confronts us with nightmares not just about China, as they refer back to, as Yan puts it, the most turbulent times Hong Kong of Hong Kong history since World War II. That's what his pieces are about, but they are also, as you will see, about world and humanity at large. They make us live through these nightmares of suppression, of climate change, of war, pitted against our own and everyone's futures. So his works, in a way, some of which we'll also um, see if performed, um, not live, but um, on screen, uh, they reflect his life as an activist in Hong Kong, and it's through this um, that we'll speak today. So Pato, my first question to you is uh, whether you can give us an idea of what that moment that you lived through in 1997 with the handover as a young Hong Kong adult um, uh, what that moment meant. Can you tell us a bit about your life in Hong Kong before and after that magic date, 1997? Okay, wow, it's, it's really a long way <laughs> because yeah, my memories have to go back to 1997 and then I remember on the day of, uh, that is uh, the 1st of July in 1997, I, I stayed in my home and I didn't go out. And, and in that year, it's, it's, it's Quite interesting that uh, uh, there are seven fireworks in Hong Kong and, and also on, on 1st of July. And, uh, and then I remember that I, I talked to my friend through a phone and then we, I, I, I forgot what to talk about. But um, there is also one, <clears throat> one uh, incident uh, on that day. That is uh, some legislative councillors of Hong Kong, they climbed, um, they they, they did an action uh, to occupy the old uh, legislative council 
The reason why, because that they were elected before 1997, but then, then after 1997, and then there was a temporary legislative council uh, to be set up for one and a half years, something like that. Just my memory. And but uh, these uh, elected uh, councillors, they were kicked out from the legislative council, and then, and then for one and a half year, and then there there were some other appointed councillors. Okay, they they took up all the seats of the legislative council. So it means that okay, well, yeah, you said uh, one country two systems, and Hong Kong has the autonomy, and then, oh, but it's not the case. Okay. And uh, I remember one of the measures because you know, thirty five years. Okay, uh, one of the measures that uh, that one and a half year the temporary legislative council. What they did is to abolish some kind of rent control in Hong Kong. So you see now Hong Kong uh, is always one of the top uh, most expensive uh, private property. Okay. It means that okay, you rent a flat or all almost uh, you buy a flat anyway. It is the most expensive, one of the most. Okay, it is com as compared to London, Tokyo, Paris. Yeah, because the rent Munich. Yeah, <laughs> the rent control is as was as abolished, abolished at that time. So yeah, this is my memory. And uh, do you want me to 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 talk about the thirty five years or just nineteen ninety seven first? Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about 1997 first, um, uh, and as you can see, I mean, already then, uh, things seem to have changed. Um, you are writing about sort of being a youth in Hong Kong in, in one of your plays, um, uh, this, this wi widely acclaimed play, White Blaze of the Morning. Um, and this play, um, you can tell us a bit more about that, is a play about youth in Hong Kong. So youth in Hong Kong, uh, you know, in 1997 or, you know, in those 25 years that ever since. Um, and the question is really, what is youth? And here I have a wonderful quote from a wonderful article on this um, play. Youth is the rising sun. Youth is adventure. Youth is doubt. Youth is a downpour. But in white blaze of the morning, youth is considered an itch on the skin. The itch on the skin is before the wound, before the event. Now, can you tell us a little bit about the significance of youth in Hong Kong and the significance maybe also of this play? Um, in yeah. terms of, you know, 1997, Hong Kong, Europe, Britain, uh, the US. Right? Okay, um, okay, let's jump from 1997 to 2014. And, uh, and actually, I, as as mentioned, I studied playwriting in London in 2014. It means that I totally, I was totally absent for the Hong Kong's protest in 2014, because at that time I was in London. And then in 2015, I wrote two plays. One is White, White's Place of the Morning, and another is A Concise History of Future China that we'll talk about later. And for this play, White's Place of the Morning, I just imagine there are five young people. And then, um, uh, they were aged um, like 20-something in at that time, in 2015. It means that um, starting from 2009, and then they, they still had an A-level examination, which was actually changed uh, after 2012, yes. And, uh, and then uh, how these five youngsters, okay, they, they face the change of themselves, because actually it is a vibrant uh, period for for a person to grow up like uh, from uh, age 19 to 20 something, it means uh, it is the period that uh, a person has to adapt to the needs from the society. Uh, and also there's a conference from their own need. And I, okay, one of the most influential writer to me is Haruki Murakami. And one of his most famous work is Norwegian Wood. Norwegian Wood is about teenagers at the age of 19. Actually, it is a troop built to Norwegian wood, something like that. And, and uh, who does this play? Uh, uh, okay, it, the story is quite complicated, so I cut it short. <laughs> um, they, they got each on their skin. And then who does the whole play? And then they have to deal with this each of the uh, skin. 
and according to um, something I forgot, uh, the natural therapy. It means that the natural therapy, uh, homeotherapy. Okay, is it? Yeah, homeotherapy. Homeotherapy. Uh, their perspective on the skin sensitivity or the itch on the skin is okay. Skin is the last front line, uh, from your inner to the outer. It means that if you have got itch on your skin, it means that you have a problem in, um, uh, in the relationship with outside with outside world. So yeah. Oh, so ah. we have the code oh, you have the code. So okay, yeah. That is uh, one of my uh, main uh, idea of the play. Because in, um, and it is, okay, for the individual, they have to face this kind of conference. But at the same time, the outside world, uh, I mean, uh, the Hong Kong society has also drastically changed at that time. So it, it, it's caused an individual, in, an individual even more difficult to, to adapt, just like you are living in a washing machine, but the washing machine is on, on and on, okay? They, they stir up and stir up again. And so finally, there, there is one, uh, one, of, one of them uh, has got a, a died. Okay, it is a kind of passive suicide. Uh, he has got some health problem, but he did not want to get cured. But actually, he was the uh, sharpest and brightest and the most outstanding among all of them. His academic academic achievement is the best, but actually he was uh, tired of the world. And then, and then finally he died. And then it is the story like this. And yeah. Yeah, maybe you have to. This uh, all sounds very enigmatic. Um, what is this all about? Why is there this youth? Um, who has this itch, or all the youth have this itch, the itch which you say is before the wound, before yes, the yes, event. Yes, yes, now, yes. now you, I guess you have to tell some of the audience at least what's happening in 2014, 15, uh, and following in Hong Kong. Yes. What is the event? Okay, uh, so for, okay, some factual background. Okay, it is, the, what I said is about the story. <laughs> and the factual background is uh, in 2014, that there was umbrella revolution. And uh, because uh, some of the Hong Kong activists, and then they advocated uh, to occupy Central. But finally, they occupy Admiralty, okay? <laughs> it is just like all history, okay? Yeah, yeah it, it's happened, yeah. And then, Not everyone knows where Central is and yeah, Admiralty yeah, so, is, so, so maybe you want to tell, yeah, tell so us. It's, so it's fine. And then uh, they, uh, they fight for the universal suffrage, the true democracy. But uh, the government's response is, uh, just to release uh, tear gas. At that time, we were shocked already. Uh, there are sixty something or seventy something tear gas, and uh, and why uh, why the protester or why some of the uh, activists they advocate to to fight for the universal universal suffrage because it was agreed in the joint declaration between uh, China and Britain, and it should be implemented at that time. Yeah, it, it is the backward. So again, you know, the basic law is supposed to be put in practice and it's not put in practice and so people go on the street yeah. and, um, you know, they, they're being suppressed. So you're saying in the in the play, today the world looks like this, tomorrow it can take on another face. Um, and the, the time between 19, 19 and 25 is sort of the time of change. And it, to me, it made a lot of sense to think of you at 22 in 1997. Yeah. when that time of change is, right? Um, anyway, um, uh, you're writing a lot of plays in 2015, as you already um, said. Uh, one of the plays is The Concise History of Future. Um, in Chinese, that's what the, what the uh, title actually means. Uh, in its English and German versions, it's called A, Ch Ch a Concise History of Future China. Um, uh, and it speaks also about those most turbulent times, as you call them, of Hong Kong's history since World War II. Two. Um, uh, and in the play, of course, you have these two main protagonists that end up in the South. So it's kind of, you know, they are on the move and they end up in the South in a city without umbrellas. Um, and in the pouring rain, of course. But we have Antigone, who has warned them not to take out their umbrellas, even if it's raining, especially not the yellow ones. So um, it's pretty obvious what you're talking about. 
Um, uh, can you tell us a bit more about this context, the meaning, the background um, to the play, um, the concise history, um, and um, uh, sort of, you know, what, what's the setup? Uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, I wrote the play, uh, this is the first play I wrote in English. I've been the full-length play. And at that time, I, uh, I studied in London, and then I wanted to try to write in English. And I, because I studied English literature in Hong Kong, I, I was an English teacher as well uh, for a long time. And then I also think that, okay, well, how I can make my exam, uh, examiner or yeah, the, my teacher understand what I want to say. Uh, the very starting point from this play is uh, uh, the June 4th massacre in, in 1989. Uh, but I don't want to stick to that point. I want to okay, uh, um, have the time dimension like 15 years. That, that is from 1989 to up and also after 50 years. And then what was the change? Uh, in in the, in the country, yeah. But at the same time, as I've said, as I've said, I want to write something which can be understood also across culture. It is the very starting point because we are talk about the dam and the save, and then you see my path. And uh, so I I try to adopt um, magical realism, the approach of magical realism, rather than naturalistic play. And I also want the audience or the readers, uh, they have different kinds of interpretation about the play. But it's not only about uh, politics in Hong Kong and China. Yeah. So I use this way of writing magical wisdom for the display, A Concise History of Future China. Yeah. Do you want us to watch it first? Yeah, and yeah. Then, okay. I think it's better that uh, we yeah. watch okay. like 10 we'll minutes. We'll watch about 10 minutes of the play yeah. and then we'll talk about the play. So, um, yeah. Michael, thank you very much for turning the lights on. And I will try and get at the right spot. Okay. It's in Cantonese, but it does have some text, so we can all
nghe đấy xong như thế này Tôi không cần nhiều Thế thì các bạn thấy điều sao tìm lệnh lời mình kê chứ mỗi lý vời tìm lệnh lời mũi dạy Mỗi hỏi như thế thì điều kỳ lỗi lời mình nhìn chỗ cô sang mình Có sớm sớm Kê nhất có như thế mình có cái mê lỗi bán của lời mình Cú sớm nhìn nhục Có nhất tình yêu đại lý của học về Phật Phật phong của sáu tôn kẻ chuyện Có một chiếc chúng ta yêu cầu chỗ quay có một chiếc học lời mình hay tìm lệnh Chờ cho mình có học tại sáu tôn và một cái kẻ chuyện Có một thị tài được bỏ Có sân thảo ở trường hình đông gần Sự hiện có bế hoa xin ngồi lời chuyện Hoa bảo hoa Tại vì ở quốc gia Công trường hình đông gần xì hậu Chỉ hiểu lệnh quần thái trường hậu mình kết quả Tại vì có tổng đoàn cái xì đoàn Nhưng có tổng lệnh quần thái xì hơi đề lời chuyện
我一受唔到，以後都見唔到你。佢笑一笑，揚一揚手，跟我嚟。嗰、那個係一個有風嘅夜晚，個月亮係血紅色，甜蜜嘅河水流過城市。我係一直咁喊，冇識同對方講嘢。我嘅視線一刻都冇辦法離開你。我最後一次咁同佢講，我哋可以喺埋一齊，但係你要作出一啲犧牲。好對唔住，呢、這個交易唔係嚟自我嘅決定。係嚟自我家族嘅歷史，我點一點頭，然後佢就慢慢咁講出呢一個交易嘅內容。我諗你哋仲記得我開頭嘅時候所講過嘅説話，我以後都唔再睇任何嘅音樂。呢一場戲最後一個對白之後，我唔會再睇到任何嘢，永遠，永遠。雖然我以後都睇唔到音樂，但我依然都覺得好開心。公平嘅交易。聽取代官。Yes. Yeah, these are these are the first two scenes of our concise history of future China, and uh, uh, you'll find that it is quite different from what I'm I've told you, <laughs> because uh, superficially it is not political. Because uh, I defined uh, very clearly that uh, like uh, for the play, it is not an advocate, but um. It is somehow it is a kind of thinking process, and also I stress on feelings more. And you see, the scene two is actually a love story. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's uh, because I also wrote articles, um, uh, political and analysis, um, uh, in Hong Kong. Yeah, and uh, for political analysis, you have to make everything very clear, direct. Okay, and you have to show your stance. But for play, um. I always uh, have a metaphor like uh, I I like uh, it's just like uh, building a matrix. It um, something here something here. Okay, it means that okay. I you can turn different turn to different faces and then you can have different interpretation. And interestingly, this play uh, when it was out and then uh, I also because it was also published in in Hong Kong and I asked my teacher to write a, a preface. And then he can relate uh, to Brexit and also Donald Trump and also the decline of democracy, and uh, it's exactly what I want to to do. Uh, yeah. So actually, in the article you write, I want my work to be a matrix. The more complex I build it, the more things the audience will see. Yeah. Now, if we um, sort of walk on in this play, actually, the next scene. Is a very interesting scene where the sinister woman and all the characters all uh, are called the sinister woman or the man who's able to feel yeah. with the others, the empathetic yeah. man, and you know. So, so you have all these stock characters basically that are defined by what they are supposed to stand for, right? So, the sinister woman、um, in the next scene, who, who you've met,、um, she dreams, and the scene is called her dream of China. An evident allusion to President Xi's China dream, 
which was first proposed in 2012 as part of his plan for the renaissance, or he calls it the rejuvenation of China. Um, she advocates the individualized quality of this dream, but the dream of our sinister woman is quite a nightmare. Um, Me Too, violence, labor camps, working conditions, skeleton on the wall of the factory, organ theft, uh, thrust, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's really pretty bad. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the meaning of this dream that she has? And <coughs> actually, it is really my dream. Uh, when I uh, when I was when I was writing plays, and I will have uh, different bad dreams, and in that period, and then one night, and then I had got the dream like uh, that's what Barbara has said. Uh, that is the, and then I wrote it as the uh, dream of the sinister girl. And actually, sinister girl, uh, in my play, the setting is she was from a blue blood family. It means that her family actually was the political elite. But she really didn't. She really don't like her family. So, uh, finally, in the play, and then she escaped from the capital uh, with uh, the man uh, who can't uh, watch musical anymore. The man is called the man who witnesses pain, and then both of them ran away to the south. And you see the first young man holding the box. Actually, he he was from the future. He is from the future, and then he traveled from. The south to the north. So basically, the, the timeline is like this. Okay, and if you want to write the plan, because I just found a uh, there's a library at CAT, and then I can donate one book of my great, book great, great. Yes, we okay, want. So to. you you can read the play. But let me also the beginning scene is very interesting. Remi remember the guy who is coming in with that box. We'll talk about the box later. And um, he comes in and he says, "We need to remember." And I need to write this down, basically, you know, yeah, things yeah, need to yeah. be written down. There's a lot of people in this play, actually, who talk about the importance of remembering. Yeah, and the, yeah, now, of yeah. course, yeah, what, what, what does that have to do with Hong Kong and with Hong Kong's position in a sort of international setting? Uh, uh, because you talk about memory, I first talk about memory first. Uh, uh, when I was thinking, and then what, what do we have as... Um, Citizens, or as a person, or as a human, and actually, memory is, is uh, okay. You may you may say it is the most important thing. It is even equivalent to identity. For here, okay, the memories are not only about uh, the histor history, m memories of history, but also memories of yourself, how you deal with everything. So. Um, that's why uh, memories play a very important role in all my three plays, actually. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and and maybe memory also just uh, as a reminder for Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong is the only place where Tiananmen, nineteen eighty nine, is being remembered or has been remembered because um, actually in the last two years it's been almost impossible to remember it, as as many of you know. Um, and actually, the only person who sort of um, complained about this, and also who complained about the 2019 protests being clamped down in a similar way to 1989, um, was, of all people, Trump. Right? Trump was the one who said, for other reasons, but anyway, he, he protested against the protests. <laughs> um, and uh, no, nobody from Europe did. Um, but Trump did. So, so you know, for, in, a, in a way, you know, what is the relationship between Hong Kong and the U.S. Yeah. and Hong Kong and Trump and Hong Kong, you know? Yes, so actually, I, I want to go back. That's why I want to go back to China, China uh, dream of China. But uh, anyway, uh, you, you mentioned to uh, you mentioned about the the kind of Fiji mem memorial of Hong Kong, and now it was a uh, crackdown. Okay, the last one was twenty nineteen. And actually, there is a relation between um, Hong Kong and also the uh, nineteen eighty nine. I would call actually I would call nineteen eighty nine democratic movements in China at that time rather uh, than emphasizing the the results of uh, June fourth massacre because at that time in Beijing, uh, I say the uh, Beijing citizens, students, and also all the people from China, they have shown. Uh, really great humanity, the spirits of humanity, and then there was a cartoon uh, in 2019 in Hong Kong. Then there were two girls, 
One was from Beijing in 1989, and then there's a glass cuts in between with another girl from Hong Kong, and then they want to touch themselves. And I would say the uh, uh, feed the memorial of uh, June Fourth Massacre or 1989 movements is really important in Hong Kong, and actually it it is something that we might underestimate. I mean, for Hong Kong people before 2019. Because it is a very important lesson of justice for Hong Kong, and we we started from our childhood, okay, and uh, and then I want to go back to the China yes, gym or China China gym, and uh, when I was taking the course of undergraduate, uh, there was a course of American literature, and then one of the main themes of American literature is American dream, and then we study it and study a lot, okay. American study students, okay, you you know that, and then I always think that okay, there's something um um f- from Xi Jinping. Actually, what is on his mind is he wants to do something like American Dream, and actually in twenty nineteen, it's interestingly there's a graffiti on China Bank Bank of China in Hong Kong, and uh two countries one system, the two countries is China and America. What I want to say here is um, there is a very famous topic. I forgot uh, how to pronounce the words, but it is the traps of world politics. Uh, the metaphor is Athens in Greeks and also Sparta. It means that when there is a sup- there is a superpower of the world, there is a secondary power. They will have a potential clash. They might go to war or not. And then there's one book, okay, tracing, uh, from okay, human history for some of the examples. Okay, some will go to war, but some won't. And uh, so I, I think now we are now in this situation. The China dreams clashes with American dream. I just want to show you this because it gives you a couple of um, <laughs> funny or not so funny um, uh, jokes in the, in in regard to the China dream being an American dream copy of an American dream, a cheap copy of an American dream, right? Um, and uh, there is this also protest in China, as you can see. Uh, this is Xu Zhiyong, who uh, is yet again um, in prison, um, who at the beginning of Corona's crisis wrote this, basically wrote an essay where he's asking Xi Jinping to step down. Um, and one of the reasons is his China dream, right? Plagiarized from the Americans. Um, and also his um, having the hubris to try to be on a par with Mao Zedong. The, the big problem is something that Lu Xun, who is one of the most important writers in the early 20th century, has already basically pinpointed when he says to dream means freedom, to talk about a dream means no dream, freedom, right? And that's what Xi Jinping is doing. To dream is to dream of something real. To talk about a dream is inevitably to lie. And it's very interesting how in the scene um, uh, where uh, she's t- the sinister woman is telling the dream, um, she ends up saying at the end, remember, remember, it's not real. I don't believe it's real. It's only a dream, <laughs> right? So, so you're playing yeah. um, constantly, right? With yeah. this question yeah. of, is it real? Is it not real? Are you doing this to also to save your skin? Save to save your skin, that is out of security reasons? Oh, no, you, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> I, I just want to play something like uh, for from the perspective of the, of the sinister, girl, sinister, sinister girl, she doesn't want to believe that it is true. Okay, say actually in the dream of the sinister, sinister girl, and actually uh, it is full of sex and violence. And, um, well, tragically, if you read the news, from the from from China recently a few months ago and then there was a Chang lady, yeah it is a an a horrible case of sex and violence and actually it happened in China, yeah that's that's why I I I kept my dream okay through the at that an adaptation and then to wrote it in in my play. Yeah. Now dreams play an important role in. Almost all of your plays, um, yeah. uh, certainly also in the libretto to uh, the damned and the saved that we will um, discuss a little bit now and then open for questions from the audience, right? Um, and now in, uh, the, I'm, I'm showing something that you can see just across the necker um, here, um, the the butterfly um, that was um, 
uh, painted just last week by Mantra as part of the Metropole um, Festival, as part of our thematic research network, um, Umwelten, Umbrüche, Umdenken. Um, and uh, the butterfly, of course, in China really stands for dreams. There is an important story by Taoist philosopher Zhuangzi, who dreams of a butterfly and then is no longer sure whether it's Zhuangzi dreaming of the butterfly or the butterfly dreaming that he's Zhuangzi. Right? So the dream is a really important um, uh, element also in, um, in the saved, the damned and the saved in this libretto, um, uh, because there uh, the dream sort of becomes infested like a cancer um, uh, it's, it, the dreams are being collected by one of the revolutionaries that you will see in a minute and they, they are collected by her and they basically become the cancer in the system that destroys the machine that is a yeah. dictator, right? Maybe, yeah, yeah. yeah and I, you, I talk about a little bit uh, about the story. Uh, Sarah and Dana, two female protestants, they were captured, they were arrested and they were tortured uh, seriously, but they, they were finally released. And then once they overthrow, uh, it's against the king of a village. And then the king is not a person, the king is a machine. And then, uh, finally, Sarah and Dana uh, connected with a man called the Dream Interpreter. And then the Dream Interpreter has invented a, uh, a, a poetic utopia, that is a box connecting all the dreams uh, of the village, of the villagers. And then, um, uh, Dana, uh, has it has found a way to kill her enemy that is uh, from the from the fellows of the king that is from the fellows of the machine uh, in their dreams so dreams are very important it, it is also a kind of resistance and 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 also uh, finally they they they, they just uh, uh, Sarah has mentioned one thing yeah um, you can't okay you have made a mistake because we were still in your system and then we will be your cancer cell, and then we will overflow you, something like that. Yeah. And so, so perhaps it's good just to watch the trailer of this opera so you can see how it works. And uh, it's loud. Ja, 
Mann radikalisiert sich und die andere betreibt einen Shop, einen Chocolate Shop. Es war wirklich in Hongkong so, dass es bestimmte Läden gab, in die dann die Leute, die die Revolution unterstützen wollten, gegangen sind und eingekauft haben. Das beschreibt eigentlich die Unterschiedlichkeit. Beide bleiben auf eine Weise traumatisiert. Es gibt eine letzte Szene, die Diana, die hat sich umgebracht, die ist in den Ozean gesprungen und dann gibt es wie so ein letztes Gespräch miteinander. Und da hat man eigentlich das Gefühl, dass diejenige, die sich geopfert hat, mit sich mehr im Reinen ist und die andere eigentlich mit ihrem schlechten Gewissen viel mehr hadert. Das finde ich eigentlich ein Blickwinkel, zu sagen, okay, es ist in Ordnung, früher zu gehen, wenn man etwas erreicht hat, was man wirklich erreichen wollte. Und dann ist es auch in Ordnung, wenn, man dann, wenn das Leben dann nicht endlos ist. So. So in a way, what you're saying with this, um, where Sarah at the end says, this era is still full of shit. Yeah. Is there hope? <laughs> is there still hope? Yeah, I, I frequently asked uh, recently. And then I, I, before that, before Russian invasion on Ukraine, and then I, was, I, I also talk about hope. But then after that, and then I said, no, I'm not sure. And then I also found that it is a, a phenomenon of a collective, uh, you, a very, a, a bushy, okay, a, the wrong pronunciation, a bit speechless situation. Because, okay, I, I have no idea. And then I look up to those uh, great writers and then no one says anything. No one has any idea of, of how we, we can, okay, uh, East, East, Dark Age. And, and then I was interviewed by a TV station in Mannheim, and then, and then I said, yeah, we are approaching to Dark Age. And then, and then the, the, the TV host uh, uh, are <laughs> really upset. And, but I think, <laughs> yeah, and then uh, I think you, you don't know that. <laughs> but anyway, because uh, uh, now the situation is, is really unsure, okay? Um, because we don't know the direction of the world, it seems to going to be um, disintegrated more and more. But okay, with a very, uh, very unstable condition, which everything can happen. So we don't know that. But uh, what we do, okay, what we can do is try to speed up the dark age, and then we open a new chapter. <laughs> okay. <It's> the... <laughs> <laughs> so it. I mean, this, this particular sort of situation, you say that, that when you write, it's hardly possible to e escape from politics, right? Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you whether that is a particularly Chinese position. Even in view of no hope, you still have hope. Um, I'm giving you an example from Wu Xun again, um, who has said that basically uh, hope uh, is really something that cannot be said to exist, but it can also not be said not to exist. Hope is just like roads across the earth, for actually the earth had no roads to begin with, but when many men pass one way, a road is made. And in the um, already in the um, great preface to the Book of Songs, which is a text that goes back all the way to 1000 BC, um, in, in that um, great preface, you have a call on the artist, on the intellectual, on anybody, to censor those above just as much as art is to teach those below. And so your sort of hope to intervene in society as a writer, is that very Chinese? <laughs> well, I don't know whether it's only Chinese, <laughs> inter intellectual, but uh, uh, what I want to say, okay, well, it is so hopeless, but uh, no, I think everyone can still do something. Uh, it's always, is there is always room for you to do something like, okay, for example, in Hong Kong, you know the suppression, you know the national security law, but there is one interesting phenomenon. Uh, there are much more bookshops, but small bookshops in Hong Kong. It means that they, they, uh, Hong Kong people, okay, suddenly become, oh, wow, they love reading. I don't know that uh, for so many years, okay. But, okay, everyone tries to do something. 
But as a writer, and I was also asked by my colleague, and then I said, yeah, and for me, I just try to keep on thinking, keep writing, and hopefully we can find something. Yeah. And, but we don't know yet. <laughs> right. But um, when they were um, putting into scene your opera and they created this metal box right it really reminded me of Lucien's passage where you know he's, ah, he's um, speaking about the iron house um, someone is coming to him and say write something write something for our journal and Lucien says no but that's you know what can I do I'm just an artist I'm just a writer I can't do anything and he says imagine an iron house without any windows and indestructible just like the iron house you just saw all the occupants are fast asleep inside right will soon suffocate Since they die in their sleep, their death will be painless. But if now let uh, I now let out a scream to wake at least a few of the sleepers so that these few then have to suffer the agonies of the nevertheless irrevocable death, would I be doing them a favor? Now, in the end, Lucien starts writing. And he writes a story which is the darkest story. We're going into darkness. He's speeding up darkness that you can imagine about China being a country of cannibals. Now, I wonder, you know, the ending scene that we just heard about um, from the damned and the saved, right, is also very, very dark in a way. But uh, so Sarah says, hope glittered when we were fighting, right? So that's that was the good one. Dana is already dead, right? She comes back sort of um, on this, as you saw it, on this, this ball. Um, and um, she just talks to her once. Um, but she ends up saying what They got to know each other with, you know, what I see, um, I see the butterfly again. So there is hope even while she disappears and while everything ends. Um, now, with this hope, you're not just writing about China. Um, you're writing about the entire world. And so in, in your um, uh, uh, story, um, and in many of your stories, a box, and it's, it's a Pandora's box, right? That plays a very important role. Why, why, why the box? Why does it come up again and again? I think Here, the, there, yeah. The box is not only about Pandora, uh, because I also study psychology, and I was always fascinated by unconscious, collective unconscious, and then I think the box is sim symbolizes this kind of stuff. And until the death and the safe, and then I, I was quite, I'm quite conscious. Okay, what I'm writing is, I want to write something like mythology. And then the box, okay, it's very important because it is something you can't explain. Yeah, and and interestingly, in the in the play, if you don't explain, and then there will be a lot of interpretations. Yeah. Except that in the box, in Pandora's box, the last thing that's in there after all the bad things come out is hope, <laughs> right? After all, so there we go. Um, uh, it's it's always good to hope. After all, um, and um, I want to ask you, sort of, as as a final um, question. You know, there is no hope if you start talking about dreams, but dreams seem to be the hope. They are collected in that box um, that um, Sarah gives to the dictator, and that basically infests the machine and creates the um, the um, <laughs> sort of solution um, to to that um, system, the end of that system. Um, I wanted to end with asking whether your um, uh, sort of willingness to keep walking, which is an, an, a title of one of your essays, has something to do with your name and what, what your parents did or wanted to do when they gave you that name. Because as you can see, Puyen, if you pronounce it properly, right now, yeah. if you pronounce it in Mandarin, <laughs> and then it would be Batao. So that means to draw out big waves. Um, is that the hope that you have? Um, and why did your parents give you that name? Uh, I, I once asked my father, and my father is also a writer, and then he said, yeah, it is poetic. And then that's, that's the answer. <laughs> But I say I am not good at swimming. I can only swim 15 meters and then I run out of breath. <laughs> We're hoping that you could swim better, right? <laughs> okay, um, I think we should um, end our two some uh, conversation here and open um, to the floor because I'm sure that there will be lots and lots of questions um, from the audience. And we want to thank Pato for. Um, <laughs>